We've been talking about very simple potential energy landscapes in which we explicitly track the features associated with every single degree of freedom. And now what we're going to do is say a little bit about ways of summarizing the features of more complicated potential energy landscapes in which we begin to move towards simple representations and what are free energy surfaces with many, many degrees of freedom. Okay, so one of these that's really powerful is the empirical valence bond model. And this is a way of constructing a high dimensional potential energy surface, uh, but it also gives us a very practical and simple way of constructing free energy landscapes along good coordinates. Empirical valence bond is a strategy for constructing a single ground state potential energy surface. It also gives you a single excited state potential energy surface from the separate molecular force fields for the reactant and the product electronic states. So as a very simple example, if you have a donor and an acceptor and you have reactant state before the electron has been transferred and the product state after the electron has been transferred, these two things will have different potential energy landscapes even at the same configuration. In the reactant state, the energy is here, and in the product state, the energy is here. As you move, that gap between energy levels flips when you go over here, and now the reactant state is less favorable, and the product state is more favorable. You can imagine mixing these in the same way that you would do if you were doing real quantum mechanics, and developing a force field to describe the potential energy landscape when you're in the, ele the electronic configuration of the reactant state, and the force field when you're in the electronic configuration of the product state. And then you just include an empirical mixing parameter, a coupling between these two states. And this can, in principle, depend on the configuration of the system, but for our purposes, we'll just let it be a constant. And, and the basic idea is that you're going to diagonalize this in the same way that you would if you were. And it effectively gives you this ground state that mixes the two energy levels. And you get an adiabatic model that really does a pretty good job of describing the energy landscape. And of course, there's an excited state up here as well that I haven't drawn. Include whatever level of empiricism that you want. You could, in principle, compute these things quantum mechanically, or you can develop force fields, use this as an adjustable parameter to get the right kinetic properties. And of course, the force fields that we use already have adjustable parameters that allow us to describe the stable thermodynamics of states A and B. So after diagonalizing this Hamiltonian, you effectively get two energy surfaces. One is a ground state, and one is an excited state. The ground state is the average of the reactant and product diabatic states, energy surfaces, minus one half of the energy gap squared plus four times the coupling squared. And excited state is just one half of the average plus the energy gap squared plus four coupling squared in this square root term. Okay, so if the coupling is zero, then these two things meet at the transition state where the energy gap would be zero. And if the coupling is non-zero, then there's sort of an avoided crossing kind of region between the two surfaces, uh, never quite come in contact with each other. And you get a very smooth uh, transition state region that you cross as you move in the energy gap direction. So the energy gap is the energy of state B minus the energy of state A. Now, what I want to point out is that if you look back at this diagram, the energy of state B minus the energy of state A is a natural reaction coordinate. When you're over here, it's positive, and as you move Along this diagram, it goes and becomes negative, and it crosses through zero right near the transition state location on this ground state surface. This is a very complicated coordinate down here, but regardless of how complicated it is, that energy gap coordinate actually lines everything up and takes all those degrees of freedom and summarizes them. All the ones that are going to be close to this transition state region are going to have the same value, delta E, energy gap of zero. Empirical valence bond is really wonderful because the level of empiricism is entirely adjustable. You can go from computing all of these terms quantum mechanically, and you can go all the way to the other extreme, and you can make an entirely empirical model that's just useful for illustrations and predicting trends. And the other thing that's nice about the empirical valence bond approach is that these force fields for the reactants and the products can be arbitrarily complicated. They can, Warshall and Sharon Hammer Schiffer have used this approach for modeling things as complicated as enzymes, where you have tens of thousands of degrees of freedom and lots and lots of irrelevant saddle points. That's okay. All those features essentially go away when you look at the energy gap instead of the individual molecular degrees of freedom, because the only ones that are changing are the ones that are chemically consequential. The effect of rotating a methyl group, for example, on the reactant landscape and on the product landscape is the same if it's a peripheral degree of freedom that doesn't matter.
that basically nullifies all these unimportant degrees of freedom and allows you to, to focus in on the ones that are actually important. So, so this is basically just saying that the energy gap provides a very natural reaction coordinate and you don't really have to go in and guess various degrees of freedom. Now, it's not necessarily one that gives you a lot of intuition about the nature of the mechanism, but it is one that's very useful for computation. Later in the, in the course, talk about the creation of diabatic free energy curves where we compute the free energy as a function of the energy gap and that sort of summarizes everything in the reactant state looks like this diabat and everything in the product state is going to look like this diabat and these two things cross somewhere where the energy gap is zero and that will become our transition state. So we'll see a lot of this stuff in electron transfer theory and also in, in chemical processes where we have actual atoms moving, particularly for proton transfers. This is quite a useful framework as well. Uh, so the, the point that I want to emphasize is that the energy gap and the empirical valence bond framework provide a very simple way of taking a really rugged and complicated landscape with lots of degrees of freedom that you don't care about and allowing you to build a simple model for the transition state region from a model for this state and a model for this state and then blending the two and also allow you and make this very simple projection onto free energy landscapes. Warshall developed this tool back in the late 70s and this has been recognized by a Nobel Prize in 2013. So the other way of summarizing really complex potential energy landscapes is by a strategy that more aims at explicit enumeration of all of the saddles and the reactant minima, the local minima, the potential energy landscape versus a one-dimensional coordinate x. Now I want you to keep in mind as I'm doing this that the real problem here we're talking about enzymes and proteins and clusters of many atoms and their rearrangements. So this is actually something that would be tremendously more complicated. In one dimension, you can imagine going through and finding every minimum and every saddle point, those correspond to maxima in, in one dimension, and actually making a list of all of them. And that's not at all trivial. In fact, if you want to read about how many of them are out there, see Doi and Wales, they've developed some scaling laws to predict the number of minima and the number of saddles that you have as a function of the number of atoms for different types of systems. The fact that that's a scaling law tells you that this is a pretty terrifying number. You know, you're often talking about systems that have tens of thousands of atoms, scaling the tens of thousands up to some higher power. That's pretty scary. Uh, so it's not at all easy to find everything out there on that landscape. But if you can, and, and there are algorithms to try and do that, uh, you can construct this disconnectivity graph where you start from the absolute global minimum energy structure and you gradually connect it to its neighboring structures and you build up a graph like this, right? So the graph stores all of these root tips, which are the minima, and the branches on the graph are places where it, they represent the lowest saddle point energy that you would have to cross in order to reach other branches of, of this tree structure that were. And so as you go up to higher and higher levels in this graph, that corresponds to processes that will presumably interconvert more and more slowly because the barriers between them are getting higher, right? So this is this disconnectivity graph approach. And there's an entire book on this by David Wales. Uh, the first one of these calculations, I think, is by Serminsky and Elber, and Karplus has done a lot of work developing these things as well, is that you can immediately look at the graph and you can see for any two structures, what is the lowest energy saddle point that you have to cross to go from one structure to the other. So to get from here to here, for example, I follow the graph and I see that I have to cross this point. To get from here over to here, I would have to cross this point. And I would, I would need to account for the free energy of this state in doing that, right? Because these two things are going to interconvert faster time scale than, than going over here. It, that has to be said with some caution, right? So this disconnectivity graph actually only shows the lowest energy saddle point between two structures. If there are lots and lots of saddle points, and we know from Doi and Wales that there are, then we can't directly infer rates or even relative rates by just looking at the disconnectivity graph. Those numerous saddle points just higher than the energy of the ones that are shown might actually change those relative rates. And I think that that's where I will stop.